I promise you that I haven't been the only person who has received the word from God and thought it's my time. I started looking for things to be different and was disappointed because what I thought should have happened, it didn't, at least not what I thought. I didn't know that when you got a word from God or when he has anointed you for kingdom purposes, you didn't just come into being. But much to my disappointment, God released me back to normal. And that's where we get confused. But here's our lesson this morning. David gets sent back to the field. He goes back to the field to tend sheep. He goes back to a familiar place after he is anointed by Samuel to be king of Israel, which is something God does with all of us. And you can't let that season of your life make you think that you are not anointed. Just because you had to go back to a familiar place doesn't mean that you are inconsequential. 99% of the time, it is possible for any one of us to give up before we actually see breakthrough, before something is realized as a physical manifestation. And the reason why the demographics are encouraged is because keeping the faith is often constrained by natural disorder. Fidelities that are certain to attract doubt Discouragement, disparities, trouble, despondence. Above all, the disappointment for all of us is facing the harsh reality of not receiving what God has promised us. In the 13th chapter of Numbers, the children of Israel makes it to the place of promise and they could not overcome adversity. All of that hard work traveling, all of that toiling, all of that sweating, all of that anxiety, the application of trying to make it. And for many of them, their efforts were incomplete, not because they were not given a promise, but because they were nauseated with psychological and emotional hysteria. And as often as it happened, they soon arrived at a place that no longer sustained them. And for many of us, it has been the same exact outcome. Our eventual place never succeeds because of the constant, seemingly insurmountable attacks of the enemy that leaves us discouraged. And in many cases, what has seemed so gladdening, what has seemed so acceptable, what has seemed so likable has become the temptation of never happening, never coming to pass. In fact, it's almost frightening to behold the missed opportunities of the believer and the church, the place where promises are made, the place where dreams are realized the place where possibilities can happen, the place where gifts are stirred, the place where prophecy becomes a reality. But chance has it that the end for many of us may not look like the beginning, meaning your story may not end as promised. The tragedy is that many of you don't realize how close you really are. Many of you don't realize that you're at the end of your final test. Many of you don't realize that your darkest hour is actually your triumphal ingress into your next level. And the last thing that the enemy wants to happen is for you and I to shift. And what gives him negotiating asset is his ability to make you think that your win is impractical. If he can distort your view with misleading and smudged diagnostics, he understands the interception of victory, the interception of conquering, the interception of obtaining. In fact, the reason why you see your enemies and not what God has promised is because the enemy 
don't want you to know that you will win. The reason why your problems are elevated is because the enemy don't want you to know that you are an overcomer. The reason why you see your giants, your trouble, your finances, your disadvantages above everything else is because the enemy don't want you and I to know that we're going to make it out of this. Now, let me help you to understand this. Everything that God has ever promised us is based on conditions or contingent upon our responses to God's word. In fact, the principle of conditionality is not a hermeneutical gimmick. But what you need to understand is this. Whenever an unfolding of events depends upon human choice, certain aspects of prophetic fulfillment are necessarily conditional, which means that in order for something to happen, there has to be a human response to God's word through attitude, decision, and character. And if this principle is contravened with machinations and deception and disobedience, your prophecy can be undermined. Everything God has ever said about you can be aborted. Let me take it a little further because there's a flip side to this. I believe this morning that there is a word spoken over your life for greatness. That's all of you who are listening to me right now. And I believe that God is calling you to prosper. But you have to understand that your anointing for the things of God is not limited to physical elements. God has a tremendous work for you and I to do. And secondly, I don't believe that the timing of your assignment is put off to some time later. I believe that God is doing a new thing in you right now. In fact, your later is your now. And I know that sounds strange, but has it ever occurred to you that God has already anointed you for what you have been waiting on? Many of you are already walking in your anointing and you don't see it. Many of you are waiting on elevation, but what you don't realize is that God has already elevated you. And I welcome the opportunity to prove it to you. The reason why I'm confident that you're already in your season is because a season is never determined by what you think or by your timeline or by physical manifestations. But oftentimes, your season can exist when life seems normal or when life seems routine and mundane. In other words, your season can begin when nothing is going on. Let's be clear. Your season doesn't always begin with a loud noise. Your season doesn't always begin with an extravagant glittering introduction. And Elijah helps us to understand this because he was asked in 1 Kings chapter 19 to go out and to stand before the Lord upon the mount while he passed by. And then the Bible said there was a huge wind, but God was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but God was not in the fire. But then finally, there came a still small voice, which give rise to the fact that sometimes God works where you don't see him. Sometimes God works where you don't feel him. Sometimes God works where you don't hear him. And sometimes God works in unobvious things. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 reads, He takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And the reason why many of us 
don't recognize the anointing operating in our lives is because we think that when God gives us a word, things should change instantly or that there should be significant movement. But many times when God calls us into something or when God anoints you for a specific cause, you have to understand that inactivity or silence doesn't mean that God isn't working or that God has disregarded you. And it certainly don't mean that you are not anointed. Sometimes when God has a work for us or when there is a special assignment, he doesn't immediately give us the throne. But in most cases, he sends us back to the field like he did with David. I'm sure you've experienced times when you were given a word and no sooner than you got that word, it seemed like everything but what God told you started happening. You were promised promotion. Then you got laid off. You were promised a house and the car got repossessed. You were told you would preach and attacks started coming from everywhere. You were told that there was a call on your life. But for some reason, everything seemed so familiar to you. And that's what I want to talk to us about for the next few minutes. A lot of times what God has promised us goes undetected. And it's undetectable because we are operating in our old function or still operating in our flesh, which means that we never see it because everything looks the same. We never see it because same circumstance, same drama, same job, same relationship, same financial struggle. And what most of us don't understand is that sometimes God gives us delay before he gives us promise. And that happens after he anoints us. In other words, God will anoint you and send you back to a familiar place. 1 Samuel chapter 16 gives us a window that we can look through as we reach for more clarity. By the time we get to this chapter, the Lord is challenging Samuel to go to the next level. And it's clear that God has a plan because Saul is dejected. It's David's time. And nobody sees it because he's young. Nobody sees it because he's ruddy. Nobody sees it because he's goodly to look at. And let me add, nobody sees you coming because you don't look like who they prefer. But God said to Samuel, this is the one I want, not Eliab, not Abinadad, not Shammah. God said, I don't want any of your seven sons. I want David. And I want you to fill your horn with oil because he's the one I'm going to anoint to be king of Israel. And so after Samuel anoints David to be the next king of Israel, look at what happens next. Second Samuel chapter 5 is interesting because it records that 20 years had slipped away since David was anointed by Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Not to mention that he was anointed on three separate occasions. But my point of reference is clear. David has to wait 20 years before he was given a throne, which brings us to this question. Where did David go while waiting on the throne? Where did David go while he waited for his season or for his time or for his opportunity, for the word spoken to come to pass? The Bible lets us know that David goes back to the field to tend to the sheep. Why is this important? It's important because some of us can't handle getting a word and being sent back to the field. Some of us can't handle receiving a word and being sent back to work or being sent back to your struggle. Let me close with this. You and I have got to learn how to praise God when nothing is going on. We got to learn how to praise God in the field. We got to learn how to praise God when we're broke. 
We got to learn how to praise him when we don't understand. I pray that this word was a blessing for your life. And I pray that you and I will learn the lesson of waiting. When we don't know what God is up to, we got to learn how to be a field praiser. I pray this word blesses you. Merry Christmas. And may the Lord continue to bless you and your family.